Uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Department of Medicine Ease of Re. I think I'm recording. Ease of Research uh, Initiative Town Hall Series, and um, I believe this is the third installment of the Town Hall Series. And uh, today we are lucky and um, honored to have uh, Dr. Esmeralda Meyer, who is the director of the Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee, or otherwise known as IACOC. And we also have, are fortunate to have um, Deepika Bhatia, who is the Associate Vice President of Regulatory Affairs, Compliance and Regulatory Affairs. And they're going to talk to us about their offices and their uh, committees. And um, uh, uh, hopefully it, uh, there'll be some time for questions after their presentations. So, uh, oh, and I'm, did I introduce myself? I'm Charlie Searles. I'm the Associate Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Medicine. So, and I'm flying solo today. So, um, uh, I'm be patient with me. I, I think I've let everybody in from the waiting room, uh, which is a new experience. And so, um, I think I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Meyer. Thank you, Dr. Searles. Esmeralda. Yes, Esmeralda. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the invitation. To, to talk to the Department of Medicine, um, especially related uh, in matters of um, the ease of research uh, survey that was conducted uh, to faculty uh, earlier in the year. So my goal today is to address uh, some of those concerns um, included in the survey, and then um, give you an update on our current functions and what we're doing to try to address uh, some of those issues. And then the last slide is uh, related to an updated uh, an update on upcoming changes, um, most directly related to the software used to submit protocol uh, applications. Uh, and then I have extra slides if we have time, um, but my goal is to allow for good amount of time for discussion um, and good QA. So this table, um, I tried to categorize and bucket, if you will, uh, the micro hurdles expressed by, by the, the, the individuals who completed the survey. Um, so my three buckets were protocol review, timeliness, and ICOC program. Uh, as far as the protocol review, so that's the top section, um, there were three main items related to the review. One is inconsistent. Uh, the second one, it was the reviewers are too picky. And then the third one, um, that uh, unrelated changes are requested um, when review, when amendments are submitted. So let me talk about the inconsistency and, and what the committee uh, has done. Uh, historically, uh, this dates back to probably five years or so as the transition was actually happening to EI, to the Huron software that we currently use. Um, there was a faculty task force formed, and from that task force, there came some recommendations. One of them was you need to provide us some guidance on how you want the protocol submitted. This was directly from the faculty. And so in doing so, the committee took that uh, quite seriously, formed uh, a working group uh, that included uh, members from, at the time, the um, Drag, what was called the Dragon Team uh, from the Office of Research Administration, and then ICOC members, both scientists and veterinarians. And that working group um, produced what is called a guidance document for submission of new and triennial protocols. And by the way, these slides are going to be available um, for, your, for your use later as reference if you want to hold me accountable. And uh, so that guidance document is available. We make it available to investigators who are submitting triennials, who are submitting new submissions, new protocols, new investigators. Um, and also it's a tool that we use to train our reviewers. So what the investigators are receiving is the same information that the reviewers are being asked, this is what you're looking for. And it's also a, a set of uh, guidance um, points for the protocol analyst in my team to guide both, both ends of, um, of the stakeholders, the, the reviewers and, this, uh, and the principal investigators. 
Um, so that's what we're doing. And that, again, helps as a, a part of a training tool for our reviewers. And we have increased consistency. However, protocols get reviewed minimally every three years. And so not all protocols have been um, through this guidance document just yet. The next item in the micro huddle section uh, is uh, that the reviewers um, are too picky. Um, maybe the, the challenge, if you will, is that um, the ICAC is bound by mainly three regulatory entities. Uh, the PHS assurance uh, that Emory received this year uh, is re it was renewed in 2024, is good until 28. Um, the guide, uh, which is the eighth edition, even though it's uh, probably outdated from 2012, uh, is still the, the guidance document that says uh, how animals need to be uh, maintained and used in research. And then for animal covered species under the Animal Welfare Act, um, there are another set of regulations. So the regulations are wide and vast. Um, that doesn't mean and justifies that the reviewers are picky, um, but again, it goes back to the guidance document where um, the reviewers are asked. This is this is the information that is of the protocol that the information may be included in different portions of the protocol, and it may be different altogether. So that's a, a risk for non-compliance right there. Um, so what we do for the pickiness is that the RPAs, the research protocol analysts, are aware they go through pre-review. Our pre-review doesn't stop when the protocol is submitted. They support The protocol analysts support the research teams and the reviewers during the review process. So as it goes through designated member review, if it goes to full committee review, if it requires uh, designated review after the full committee has discussed it, um, the teams are supported throughout with the um, with the availability of the research the protocol analyst. Um, so that that has helped. And then the last item on this section is that changes are maintained are um, unrelated. Uh, to our related sections are um, commented on by the reviewers when other amendments such as adding personnel uh, is submitted. Uh, and that is uh, very clear from the ICAC. They all agree, scientists, veterinarians, uh, community members agree that an amendment submitted is reviewed to the extent of the amendment um, that, that requires that amendment. And so if it's personnel amendment, it will be, it will be focused on pre-approval training, OHS screening, the person is part of the Emory community, et cetera. Um, other things that are found during that amendment are noted uh, by the protocol analyst and the PI is made aware. And we tell them when you submit the next amendment, please address these other issues that were um, identified. That happens, we're all humans. The next bucket is timeliness. And for that, um, I always tell my new investigators when I meet with them, there is no such thing as expedited review for IACUC. Um, the closest to an expedited review is what occurs when there is a just-in-time notification from a funding agency. And we do take those uh, very seriously. So the first thing I tell the investigators is if you have a just-in-time notification, send me an email and uh, we'll see what your protocol is. Does it need to, do you need a new protocol because the current protocol doesn't cover the new objectives of the uh, potential funding? And we work through with, with the investigator on making sure that the just-in-time is fulfilled. Uh, so we know that that is a critical aspect of, of the review. Um, and, and so far, uh, NIH, for example, accepts letters from my office indicating this submission um, is under review, is going, it requires full committee review, it will occur on this date, and we don't expect any delays. Please continue with the administrative process for the just-in-time. And usually that has been sufficient. Um, it also depends on the institute um, that is funding. But overall, we don't seem to find too many obstacles there. So there are ways we can work through just in times. Um, the overall review time, it takes uh, between two and three months, depending on the complexity of the research that is being proposed, whether it includes Animal Welfare Cover Act, um, cover species, um, 
that usually they all have to go through uh, full committee review. And so it requires additional time for, for, the, for the completion of the, of the review. Um, so we do monitor the review times. And importantly, we, re we um, have a dashboard created through the robotics process automation that allows me to check on review cycles. Um, because it's not just the length, the overall length of the protocol review, but also how many times the, the protocol is going between reviewers and the, the research team. Um, when we go at beyond three or four cycles, usually the RPA reaches out to whoever is going back and forth and say, what do we need to do to help the research team answer uh, the questions or concerns that you have? In a, in a more concise way, um, or sometimes they choose and the reviewer meets with the, with the research team to address concerns outside the platform. So we do monitor those review cycles um, because the, that is an indication for us that the review is gonna take longer than expected. Um, and then the onboarding of new personnel is long. We understand that there are many platforms where training needs to be completed, so currently, Pre-approval training is completed in the ALS platform, the basic, uh, working with the ICAC, for example. Uh, but there are also, if they're going to be doing weaning or uh, breeding, then they need additional training that is in another platform, which is Brainier, is a new MRA learning management system. And then if they're going to be doing surgeries, they need to contact DAR to complete that initial didactic. So we have come up with a guidance document that basically teases out all the requirements of the education and training policy so that um, investigators know what the requirement is going to be, where they find it, who they need to contact to complete that requirement. So training is one part. And then the other element of pre-approval of personnel is the OHS screening. That is challenging because it's outside Emory, uh, sorry, um, IACAC doesn't control that. Um, so it's with the Occupational Health and Safety Office. They're uh, great partners with us. Uh, they have worked with us so that the records are showing now in the IACAC. But it's still, if it's a, if it's an undergraduate or an individual with a sponsored account, they can't access the home platform. So they need to complete a separate um, questionnaire. So we work with the investigators, knowing who they are. They send emails to our ICAC, and that's our recommendation. If you have new personnel, here is a guidance document that walks you through the different steps, the different platforms, um, because it is complex. And we are looking for ways to simplify the bottlenecks and, and just simplify the overall, streamline the process. Um, and then the last bucket is the ICAC program. Uh, overall, the ICAC wants things done their way. Um, again, is bound by regulatory requirements. There are certain things that the regulations, either Animal Welfare Act or OLA, the PHS Assurance, say that we will do, and we just have to do it. So with that, there are um, 33 policies, close to 30, 30 plus policies, let's say, uh, ICAC related policies. They are all posted on the um, ICAC SharePoint and uh, we remove them um, for the majority. We remove them from the public side. They're all moved. They're now available in SharePoint, but they get reviewed every three years or sooner if, if there is need. Uh, we recently modified if you are an animal, uh, animal user you should have received our newsletter for December and noted that there were changes to the blood collection policy, to the behavioral enrichment uh, policy, because we now have ferrets uh, for now a year. And so the procedures and certain policies uh, needed to include that species um, requirements. So we do, re the committee does review those policies, uh, you know, periodically and as needed. Um, we encourage uh, meetings with veterinarians, and this is uh, what I tell my new investigators uh, when they come, and uh, we, we encourage them to uh, meet with the veterinarian staff. Each facility has a veterinarian as, uh, um, assigned to it, and it is helpful when the experimental design is discussed with the vet before you actually go in to add um, information in the platform. Um, that helps with the overall review and the information that needs to be in the protocol. Um, and last but not least, 
Uh, there were concerns about the demerit points as it comes to, uh, as it relates to either um, adverse events that becomes non-compliances or site inspection findings. As you know, the ICOC inspects um, facilities, uh, over 20 facilities now, and lab manage, uh, PI lab manage space. So those are um, site, called site inspection findings. If there is anything found outside of what the guide um, requires. <laughs> and uh, for there's currently a policy that includes a point system, points that assign on rolling basis, they accrue over 12 months, but um, they uh, roll off after a year. So currently the committee is debating, is evaluating whether the point system is actually useful. And uh, we haven't assigned points in the last two cycles. They want to see more information in terms of we are collecting how many site inspection findings we've had every reporting period, how many non-compliances we've had. Um, and with that information, the committee will be better educated to determine, yeah, we need to keep the point system or not. So those are addressing the micro hurdles. Let me move to the next one. And this will probably go a little faster. So on this slide, I have circled the different functions of the committee. And what I'm going to give you is the different functions or um, actions that we have in, you know, make changes to, to improve our uh, overall processes. Uh, the first one, I always have the ICOC protocol at the top, the main function, and nothing happens at Emory without an approved protocol. And so the main function of the committee is to ensure that those protocols get reviewed to the best possible way. Um, so what we're doing is having four protocol analysts assigned to uh, reviewing and managing protocols has helped um, their availability to help the research community. Um, so re rely on your protocol analyst to submit amendments, submit new protocols, et cetera. Uh, one item, that's the second line, the ARQA testing approval that is done by DAR, Division of Animal Resources. All biologicals used in animals need to be uh, reviewed um, by the DARQA team. And that often delays the time. That is, it's not that is new, is that it hasn't been advertised quite enough for the investigators to know that as you're submitting your new, sub, your new protocol or your triannual, those materials, those biologicals need to be tested again. As far as post-approval monitoring, uh, which is required, is a function of the committee. Um, we send investigators a reminder of obligations through an attestation. It is done, it's sent through DocuSign. And it's not only to the principal investigator, but it also goes to all the members in the protocol that handle who handle, who handle animals. And this is a reminder that although the PI is the one who signs off primarily on the responsible use of animal subjects, that the research team, those who actually go down to the vivarium and do CO2 euthanasia, that they are also responsible for the animal welfare and ensuring that only what is in the approved protocol is done to these animals. So we send them that reminder. That has been helpful. We have received positive, positive feedback from the community. So we are um, we we continue with that the post approval training binder um, training that uh, we give investigators during the site inspections we started that this period that just ended between June and November of 2024 uh, we're giving them uh, all investigators that are inspected a table with personnel and the missing training that those instances were. The ICAC office cannot verify that a training or an assessment was completed. We will continue with that um, with that process because uh, it was it was enlightening. Um, we had a lot of investigators asking us we was uh, continuing education, and that hasn't that's not new to the education policy. It's done every three years. All principal investigators must complete it, and all the animal handlers need to complete it. Um, is that now we are retrieving those records and ensuring that personnel actually completes it every three years. Um, new this uh, reporting period started December 1st. We're giving new investigators and um, those who are inspected a binder with all the basic information that we have been giving them during the inspections, but we felt that it was a better investment in our uh, return in our investment of time and effort 
um, to just give a binder with the basic policies of, that are applicable to their protocols, the alerts, the templates that the ICAC has put together to help um, and ease the research uh, with animals. And then the outreach to new investigators, which is an active outreach. We have different sources to find who new investigators are as they come to Emory. And uh, we want to talk to them early and get them onboarded into the system so that their protocol uh, is up and running sooner than later. The current semi-annual inspection cycle started December 1st, goes all the way to May 31st. So if you have you get inspected and you have had animal activities in the last six months, chances are you will receive an email from our office. We post the schedule in the SharePoint site. Um, of importance to you, like I said, I've mentioned it this morning uh, various times, our policies, guidance documents, relevant documents are all in SharePoint. And uh, those who use Animal Welfare Act covered species uh, need to be, get, be getting ready for the um, inspection. It's an annual inspection. It's usually unannounced uh, from the USDA APHIS. Um, they came in uh, mid-January this year, so we're expecting them uh, next month. And then for the Primate Center, they usually, well, they came this year in June. So they don't need to announce themselves, uh, but they minimally need to visit a facility um, every year. For in assurances, as far as reporting and um, update of policies and memorandum of understanding and institutional assurances, just a heads up, uh, this is new this year from OLA, NIH OLA, because um, if you have collaborations that are outside the United States and uh, there, there is funding, NIH funded, funded uh, funding associated with that collaboration, chances are OLA is going to ask the investigator to complete a foreign assurance. And so we have those go to full committee meeting. So it takes at least uh, waiting to the next, uh, the next meeting when, when the committee meets. Um, so heads up if you have foreign um, collaborations. And I have already talked about OHS, um, the annual review that is needed. So I'm not gonna elaborate any more on that. And then the last minutes I want to spend uh, talking about the upcoming change to IACUC. The software is gonna be migrating to or move to uh, the new um, Insight, uh, which not only going to host IRB, IACUC and conflict of interest, but is going to host uh, many other systems, administrative systems uh, here at Emory. Um, and that relates to the micro hurdle mentioned that this submission side is unwild, the approvals take forever, regulations are too stringent. So we're hopeful that with the new system um, in, inside that that submission side is unwildly will go somewhat away because you will be able to see a tile um, as soon as you uh, log into the portal where if you have IRB protocols, you'll see them there. If you have animal um, care and use protocols, you'll see it there. You have agreements, you'll have conflict of interest, you'll have all of your uh, sponsored account information there. So is um, the goal is to have it as a one-stop shop. Um, the discovery will start in January, although we are having, uh, the, we, the ICAC office, and uh, through the committee, we're having calls with the users of Mass General Brigham, who is where the Insight software is um, was created and is being used. Uh, those calls have been uh, very enlightening. It helps us understand how they use it, uh, the workflows, the logics. And uh, the committee is already thinking of how we want to, how they want to implement the new platform. The transition is going to be challenging. Those may recall when we transitioned to Huron, it was uh, difficult and it was uh, challenging. Um, I don't wanna promise anything on this transition, um, but uh, we'll do our best to support the research community so that business will continue, research can continue with animal subjects. Um, but uh, there will be some um, some changes coming coming your way if you're an animal user. I'm going to stop there and uh, happy to hand it over to Deepika and we can answer questions at the end.
Thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to start, but if you all have you know any burning questions for Esmeralda, we can definitely um, get those out of the way first. All right. Um, can, I ask, can I ask one question just related to that last bit there? So this Huron is going away then, and this, this the the new Insight platform will, will host all of the animal protocol stuff. That is correct. IRB, conflict of interest, sponsor accounts, agreements, IACOMP. And... Um, so uh, an investigator's protocols that's already in Huron, for example, will be automatically populated in this new. It will be transferred. So let me say it will be transferred to the new insight. However, the questions that currently um, are included in the EIACAC form will not appear just the same in insight. And so what we have done already is kind of, uh, uh, we mapped out uh, what the questions we currently have in EIACA to what the prototype questionnaire looks like in Insight. We were provided with that. And uh, that's part of what the IACA is looking, the committee is looking at in terms of what questions we will need uh, or what questions we don't have and we need to consider. Um, so it's not going to be a one-to-one -one transfer. Um, is going to be, and, and it was the same when um, the ICA trans transition from Topaz to uh, Elements to uh, EIACA, right? It was not a one-to-one, -one and there, there, there is a, a concerted um, effort to map out the questions and where that information needs to go. Okay. Um, so that's why we started early. Hopefully, uh, it's, it's never early enough, but we yeah, have a lot of, it seems like a lot of work. Yeah, and uh, figuring out where all that information is going to go, how it's going to be structured. So it will and, be a new form. Okay, thank you. Um, going back to those buckets of micro hurdles that you were talking about, I was just curious about. Um, is there are there time the timelines for protocol review are uh, they're per protocol obviously right I, I mean they are there's not a stand there's no standard timeline for protocol review uh, the overall review time is dependent on the protocol and the complexity and the species however uh, what the ICOC did agree and this was part of what the task force um the ICOC task force faculty task force um suggested and and the ICOC agreed to that is that the reviewers are given time a certain time frame to respond to their assignment and so for an initial submission um, that is initially, uh, pardon the repetition, but is just assigned to this reviewer, they have two weeks to respond. So they have two weeks to go into that um, assignment, review it, add comments, and then they submit. It goes through the PI, the PI responds. And then for a, a reviewing anything after the first review, they have one week. So we do have time, we, the ICAC office, the protocol analysts have a time frame that we all track to see when is this review due. The reminders are sent to the reviewers, the chair becomes involved. If we have a reviewer that for, you know, has an emergency, can't review. Um, and so the, the chair has the authority um, to reassign or to take it himself and he does the review. So. Um, in terms of set times, those are the only set times related to review process is how long the reviewers have to respond. Two weeks for the initial assignment, one week after um, comes back from the PI. Okay, thank you. And um, the reviewers have a term or are they indefinite, indefinite reviewers <laughs> or... What is That's that? a good question. Currently, there are no terms on um, what happens is the 
I guess is invariable. Eventually, uh, investigators um, with their chair discuss and they determine I've served three years and uh, I'm going to step down. And so that's that's perfectly acceptable. Um, we have, uh, you know, the veterinarians probably tend to uh, last longer as members of the committee because um, they change less. Um, but we recently, this year, Mike Yorkamp, Dr. Yorkamp, uh, retired. And so we had, um, you know, redistribution of reviewers. And so one of their alternate veterinarians, senior veterinarian staff became, um, you know, a voting member. Um, so the, it's cycles. Uh, we're always uh, looking for IACUC members. So let me do, you know, interject that plug here, the opportunity yeah. to say we are always looking for uh, IACUC members. Scientists are the, the hardest to come by just because your uh, responsibilities are primarily to do research. Um, but uh, there is there is um, the service given to the IACUC is, uh, is incredible. No, no. No work can occur without IACUC at an institution that really receives NIH funding or federal funding for that matter. We have DOD and various other yeah. uh, federal funding sources. So having scientists as members of the committee is critical. Um, I want to say we want to we have probably a little over half of scientists that are and represent the scientists represent both the primate center as well as the uh, School of Medicine and, and Memory College of Arts and Sciences in Oxford. Um, so we have faculty from the, we don't have anybody from Oxford because it's only Dr. Thompson there, um, but we certainly have uh, scientists from ECAS as well as the School of Medicine. So. Anybody, uh, you know, a principal investigator who is uh, willing to serve on the ICAC, um, the executive reviews it and uh, makes a recommendation to the committee. But there are no terms to, to your question. Okay. Last question, um, at least for me, I guess, is um, the communication was so in the midst of a protocol review, how how is the communication done? Or how and um is there is this all done by email for example or is there is there office hours or is there you know that kind of thing face-to-face -face type discussion all of the above okay so, it's, so we uh, the main communication occurs through the system and that means that the pi submits or the proxy submits the proposal the RPA is always in the middle, is that intermediary. So we mediate between the, because it's blind review. The yeah. PI doesn't know who the reviewers are. Um, and the RPA assigns, we have a roster of reviewers, scientists and veterinarians. So there's always one scientist, one veterinarian who reviews the proposal. And then um, everybody gets notifications when the, through the system when those assignments occur. When it goes back to for additional review, the um, reviewers get notified. You have, a, you know, a proposal back in your dashboard. So it happens in within the system. There are instances, as I alluded earlier, when um, the protocol is going back and forth more times than we normally see them uh, go back and forth. The, the cycles increase, and that's where the RPA or myself will go in and see what is happening. And we reach out to either the PI because they are not responding or the reviewer because keep saying that my question is not answered. My question is not answered. So we go back to the reviewer. Can you give me more details? What is it that you are looking for so that we can go back to the research team and guide them on what information is needed to respond to your concern? So we do that. That's off the system because we don't want to have that back and forth. Yeah. within the system and it goes nowhere. So yeah. that's where we step outside. We do it via email. I call them, whatever it is we need to do to make that communication uh, simpler. Um, and then I, I would say those are would those would be the two main ways to communicate as far as a review is concerned. There are instances where the veterinarian, for example, if it's a concern with the veterinarian, where they just reach out to the PI and say, hey, I'm reviewing your proposal. This is my concern. What can we do, right? 
Um, one portion, one section of the overall review process is called the veterinary consult. That is um, an opportunity or offers an opportunity for the investigator to meet directly with the veterinarian and basically discuss the experimental design. If the veterinarian has any concerns, then during that time is, is known, right? The PI knows who the veterinarian reviewing doing the vet consultation uh, is. Um, so that's an additional venue, but that happens before the blind review starts. Okay. I, did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that's good. I, I was just thinking about, um, you know, if a review is taking a little bit longer than maybe the investigator thought that is there is are there's dialogue going on about like, yeah, we're working on this. But I mean, it seems like it would be very helpful for that kind of interaction that you just described where, you know, the reviewer or the pre-reviewer, I guess, would, um, you know, actually work more close, work very closely or somewhat closely with, if there are particular questions, work closely with the, uh, the investigator. I mean, I think yes. there's a lot of anxiety, right? That, might build up if you have a protocol that's being reviewed and you haven't heard much about that review. And so yeah. um, what what often happens and we encourage this is the investigator or the proxy sends an email to the protocol analyst and say, yeah. have you heard anything about this? And so, it, you know, the protocol analyst will look is like, OK, this was a sign because we have a timestamp. Yeah, everything in the system is timestamped. Um, this was a sign on this day. We still have a few days. Let's wait until the two weeks or the one week after reassignment comes by. If we don't hear from the reviewer, then we'll prompt them. And that's exactly what the protocol analysts do. So any questions that the investigator or the research team has related to the review or their protocol status, um, we encourage them to reach out to the protocol analyst. Um, less and less I'm hearing, I, I did hear a lot at the beginning, I don't know the status of my review. Um, that's, uh, that used to be a very yeah. common yeah. Uh, common feedback we would get. Yeah. And having uh, the protocol analyst involved from, like I said, from the pre-submission all the way through approval in that process has helped to mitigate the anxiety, yeah. as you mentioned of not knowing what's happening with your submission. So always reach out to the protocol analyst and uh, we have them listed on, in SharePoint, the front page, um, who they are, who could be, but it doesn't mean that uh, if you get an out of office from Jessica, then Aya will step in and say, well, let me look. I know exactly what is happening and let me reach out to the reviewer. Um, because there are instances while the protocol is being reviewed that the PI gets a just in time. We've had those instances. And so we ask them as soon as you know a just in time is coming in, let us know so that the two week, the one week period goes away. Because right now it's a matter of can we get these two FCR, you know, the next FCR is next week. Can we get everything resolved before that FCR instead of going DMR post FCR? Um, which is designated review to address comments after yeah. the committee has seen it. Um, my goal would be, but it's, it's very hard just because the protocols are complex that everything gets resolved before it goes to full committee meetings so that they can approve it. But most times there is always something pending that the PI has to address. Okay, thank you very much. I don't, I want to move on to Deepika here. So, um... I think, yeah, you're muted now. I don't know. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Esmeralda. That was a very comprehensive update. And we are we are cautiously excited about um, insight with everything that it will be bringing on. Um, so I have a couple of updates to share. And I, I'm seeing a lot of our RAS friends over here, which I'm super excited about. Um, but I also want to make sure that I'm tailoring the... Uh, presentation slash discussion to any faculty members that um, are are with us today. Yeah, I'm not sure how many faculty members are here. 
All right. Um, you got me. That, <laughs> yes, you, um, you of course. But I, I also wanted to make sure that, and I'm, I'm always very happy to see our um, RAS partners. We couldn't do many things without them. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my screen. It will not be death by PowerPoint. Um, I just want to um, share a few um, updates with you all. Um, so I think for many of us, uh, many of y'all who have uh, worked closely with our team, um, y'all do know, um, here we go. Y'all do know the Research Compliance and Regulatory Affairs Office. We are very much um, um, a hub of research compliance services that we offer. And um, the IACUC, of course, um, led by Esmeralda is one of our fabulous teams. Um, we work very closely with the schools, departments, faculty members, our RAS teams, our OSP on um, conflict of interest as well as conflict of commitment. Um, we have a lot of international research that takes place and we wanna make sure that we um, keep expanding on those uh, international um, horizons and global um, research opportunities. So we do have an export control team that helps out with that. We also have a research integrity team that works with anything which is research misconduct related, making sure that we have compliance with our protocols on the human side as well as on the animal side and basic science side, um, anything control substances related. And then we, of course, have a couple of our newer arms um, uh, created in the last uh, two years or so to meet regulatory requirements for research security and then also for program effectiveness. Um, program effectiveness, where you all might have a lot of interaction on, is on the minors and research programs because we, uh, we established or re-established that last earlier this year. Um, began that work last year and uh, um, updated the policy. We have a really robust process now for making sure that we have intake and vetting that takes place for minors when they are applying for research activities. Um, so that's one of the one of the focus areas that has been for um, the program effectiveness unit. But in addition to that, um, we also are bound by our roles and responsibilities to do um, investigations and training. So that's um, that's also one uh, some of the other uh, initiatives that the program effectiveness units, uh, uh, program effectiveness unit heads. As you're all aware, we are in the middle of the annual certification cycle that went live on um, actually December 1 was Sunday this time. And so the notifications went out on Sunday morning. So this is just a reminder for everyone that um, all um, researchers, so anybody who is involved in design conduct and reporting of research does um, get qualified as a covered individual and has to um, provide and log in their um, conflicts of um, interest. Um, and um, we do have, as you all remember, because all, many of you all were in those conversations when we were launching eDisclose um, a couple of years ago that the process has been extremely streamlined. So we don't have um, disclosure requirements at every stage of a project, um, at proposal stage, then at award management, then at no cost extension or um, change um, or an amendment that might be going through at an annual report timeframe. So we don't have any of those that happen, but we do have requirements for making sure that at the time of um, uh, anybody who is a new hire, so within 30 days, we um, do require them to disclose. And then during the annual certification cycle, of course, and then if there are any new significant financial interests um, that have been either acquired or discovered in the last 30 days, so those have to be updated and disclosed as well. Again, as a reminder, because I know our RAS teams go through this on and on um, during during the um, search cycle for sure, um, that we don't we do not allow for research proposals to make sure that we are meeting NIH requirements um, and other federal agency requirements um, unless we have an up to date um, profile on uh, in eDisclose for um, the uh, disclosure as part of the disclosure cycle updates. Um, and I'll be sharing these slides just as a reminder on um, SFI, um, our significant financial interests, and um, our policies, 7.7 uh, .7 and 7.24. They're very much up to date. Uh, 7.38 for conflict of commitment as well, which is all managed at the school level. 
Um, so I did want to share a couple of reminders, given that we are um, in the middle of um, the certification cycle that will end um, on February 28th. We do have um, office hours that the team is hosting every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, and um, uh, when I share the information, I'll make sure to add the link to the training workshop and virtual office hours. It's, uh, it's one Zoom link that is available and the team can also send out calendar appointments if those are helpful. So happy to answer any questions. Um, I also have some um, important stuff that I can share on controlled substances if there's interest in that, uh, because we do have um, GDNA um, inspections. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'll reshare again. We do have GDNA, so that's the um, Georgia Drug and Narcotics Agency doing routine inspections um, that should be concluding at the end of um, December. Um, This is for clinical research or for um, basic research, all, all research? Um, so controlled substances mainly is for um, animal research and basic research. We do have our investigational drug services that uh, manages um, human research um, drug protocols or protocols that use um, investigational product um, drugs as investigational products. The COI is across the board. It's anyone doing any type of research. If you touch research, you become a covered individual. Yeah. Um, okay. And the COI, um, we now get, we, we get reminders for that, right? We're not. Yes. Yeah, so there was there were emails that were sent out on Sunday morning, that was December 1. And then we will be sending out a couple of other um, reminders before that February 28th cycle, um, just so that there is um, there is a constant, it's, it's on everybody's radar constantly um, to make sure that uh, we do get profile updates done before February 28th. Is, are there any um, questions from the audience? Silence. Um, the integrity part of your office. Can you ex expand on that a little bit? Yes, for sure. Um, so the integrity part of our office, one of the main things that um, we handle is allegations of research misconduct. And uh, we have a lot of um, effort and initiatives that have been put in place for um, making sure that we can address any allegations for fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism of research. Um, so just reminding you all about, you know, when we started the year in 2024, there was a lot of angst and um, um, a lot of news about um, executive leadership and presidents in universities such as Harvard who were impacted. And then um, I think around the March, April timeframe, there was a lot of talk about similar um, uh, similar type of activity happening in Colombia, where uh, researchers' publications were getting impacted. There was a lot of um, comments and uh, concerns that are coming out from a website called this Puppier. And um, so those are those are some of the areas where we see um, that there is uh, plagiarism that can happen. So there can be a direct copy or paste of um, verbiage um, that has been used in previous publications, previous proposals even. Um, and then, or there can be misappropriation of ideas, which also accounts for plagiarism. And then there's, of course, falsification and fa fabrication. We see a lot of that as part of image manipulation. Um, and the reason, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of reasons why we've, we've started seeing a lot of a um, uh, lot of this come into the news. One is there is uh, the regulatory landscape has changed. So the Health and Human Services Office of Research Integrity at the federal level, um, they do have um, there's a there's a new policy that's coming out, and that policy has been changed about um, after 20 years of its existence. Um, there is also a lot of connecting the dots with um, research uh, product 
to research sponsorships so the federal dollars itself that are connected and so that that then gets also amounted to um, false claims type activity when the federal government that comes back on any substantiated cases where we have proven that there is research misconduct to hey give us our money back um so that's that's one piece of it the second aspect is there are a lot of software tools that are now available um to be able to easily detect um, things like plagiarism as well as um, fabrication and images. Um, and so one such tool, it's called Authenticate. Um, we do have that on campus and we are in the process of um, providing licenses. We acquired the tool earlier this year in the June, July timeframe. Um, and so those licenses are available. It is a very easy to use software tool. Um, you literally put in your document and it'll um, come up with flags on which content is perhaps plagiarized because it does this. It, it uses this patented technology according to Authenticate for um, scanning through anything which is published um, on the internet. And because it's our license uh, for Authenticate, it's an institutional license. So it's very um, confidential and our proprietary information doesn't get shared outside. Um, we chose Authenticate mainly because um, federal agencies such as NIH as well as DOD, they also use Authenticate as part of their proposal review processes. Um, and so that that's a very, very easy to use very credible tool that we um, we are heavily promoting that our faculty um, get uh, licenses for, uh, open up their accounts and start using it, especially when there is a manuscript or publication that is getting submitted. And even at the time of proposal, because we have had, um, we have been notified um, via news articles, as well as as part of webinars and forums that we, are, um, we participate in, that uh, there is, um, a lot of focus on making sure that there is no fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism happening, even in, even at the proposal stage, which is a little bit of um, an atypical um, scenario for how um, we have usually seen research misconduct at the level of publications. Um, so that's one, one big part of what the research integrity team does. Um, another aspect is around controlled substances, um, because we make sure that uh, there are license investigators have DEA and or, or GDNA licenses, depending on whether they're using controlled substances and or, or dangerous drugs. Um, there are some nuances to making sure that uh, where the drug is stored um, and the address where the work is done have to be matching. There's a lot of requirements around um, storage and shipping and destruction. Um, and so the team provides a lot of resource and guidance for our investigators around that. As part of the GDNA um, inspection, we do have a prep checklist that, um, and we have a very good relationship with GDNA as well as with DEA. Um, and so we uh, we do this this time because uh, these were um, routine and um, uh, not focused um, inspections. We did uh, get updates and routinely, fairly routinely, do get updates from um, the uh, from GDNA around um, uh, which faculty members might be getting um, might be getting inspected. Um, I do want to make a clarification that as opposed to something like Authenticate, right, where it's an institutional license, DE and GDNA licenses are registrant specific. So it's, it's very much on the investigator to make sure that they have compliance with DEA and GDNA requirements. And that's why we provide that extra add-on support and resources from our team um, to make sure that, yes, Emory's research is not impacted, but we're also protecting our um, investigators. Um, so whether it's licenses, whether it's making sure that drug accountability is maintained, and then... Um, also making sure that if there is any um, findings or observations from inspections, that we are responding to those on um, a fairly uh, prompt, in a fairly prompt manner, and um, also making sure that we are able to um, help our investigators and labs um, to resolve those at, uh, at the earliest and um, uh, to the fullest capacity that we can. Um, and then there is routine um, compliance related work that the team also does with regard to um, uh, looking into any non-compliance that might have happened at the protocol level, which may go beyond um, the IACUC and IRB requirements. So anything which is say data management related or um, it has a federal agency component to it that we have to have reporting done. Um, those are some of the other things that the research integrity team does. 
But the research integrity team, oh, thank you for that. The, the research integrity, integrity team, um, they're not proactive necessarily, right? They're kind of reactive. Um, so it's a mix. So we have a very big um, and robust training and awareness program that we keep building on every year. Um, so while we do some um, some work, which has to be react, which ends up being reactive because we act upon any allegations that we receive either um, directly from agencies or they come in through the trust line um, or we get pinged by ORI. Um, we do make sure that uh, based on trends um, noted and even otherwise, right, if there's a regulatory change that's happening, if there's a new policy that we're putting in place, uh, we work very closely with the schools and uh, we do a lot of training and awareness across departments to make sure that there is a good understanding of um, uh, regulatory requirements as well as um, strategies and tips that can be used for preventing um, research misconduct. Do you think that the Authenticate um, software is going to be used for every grant that gets submitted? Well, it would be nice. We are not mandating the use of Authenticate, um, but it would be it would be um, ideal, right? If we had everything going through Authenticate, because it gives us peace of mind, it gives the investigator peace of mind. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's credibility on the software and uh, we have um, safeguards in place, right, because it's an institutional account. So it's it's all retained within that account. It's not getting shared between investigators across Emory or even outside um, of Emory. Yeah, it seems like a tool that probably is going to be used more and more and more, right, I guess, over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> NIH, um, in fact, very uh, promptly, they have on their website that they provide authenticate services yeah. and they have um, um, a mini uh, department um, at NIH because I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and um, Sheila Garrity, who's the director of ORI and her team were presenting um, at the conference and they mentioned that they are still um, you know, taking in requests for authenticate proposal reviews. Um, and it takes them, it used to take them about three days. It takes a little bit longer now because the volume of requests has increased. Um, but it's also because smaller institutions are not always able to um, get institutional licenses for something like Authenticate. So I think it's a, it's very fortunate and favorable that we have the license. So we should, we should definitely um, yeah. have somebody taking advantage of it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. That's a great overview of your office. Um, I will open the floor one last time. I see we're at the top of the hour here. So does any of the uh, members of the call have any questions for our guests today? Well, uh, if not, I would like to thank our guests, um, Esmeralda and Deepika, thank you so much for coming to our town hall. Um, this this uh, meeting was recorded, so it'll be available for review by anybody who's interested. And um, I understand, Deepika, that Vibha Lama wants you to come back at some point to talk about some of the I guess some of the changes the NIH might be making, particularly to the biosketch and foreign travel. So um, we're gonna we'll set that up for a future date in the new year. Yes, absolutely. Happy to be back, and um, I can bring my other partners in crime with me. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, once again, thank you, and um, thanks to our attendees today. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you.